Can you? Can everybody hear me? Just if you'd like to write in the chat box, if you wrote to yes, you can all hear me, yeah? Excellent. Great. Good to see you all. Well, it's a pity that I can't see your faces, but anyway, at least uh, you can see mine. I'm not sure if that's good or bad, okay, <laughs> that you can see my face. But anyway, here I am, uh, here from Spain, I'm talking to you. Um, great. What we're going to do in this uh, session today, it's going to be 45 minutes. Um, and what I wanted to do was to uh, share some basic ideas uh, about vocabulary teaching that are important for me in my classroom. And of course, because I also am a writer of textbooks, they're also central really to my philosophy, if you like, to vocabulary teaching, um, which appears in Gateway. So if you are using Gateway, or if you're thinking of using Gateway, then I think that a lot of the things will help you to see exactly what my approach to vocabulary is. Um, I want to begin with a, a very basic idea or basic question. Why is vocabulary so important? Um, it's interesting that uh, I'm talking about vocabulary and then Rebecca is also talking about vocabulary. So why do we spend so much time talking about vocabulary? Well, this is a great quotation uh, from a linguist called David Wilkins. You might have heard of him. Um, this book, uh, it's a little bit old now, but uh, this, uh, I think, is a great uh, quotation. He says, we can communicate little without grammar, and he says, we can communicate nothing without vocabulary. And I think that's a great, great quotation because uh, grammar is important. But if you think, uh, if you have the present perfect or the conditional, but you don't have any verbs, any nouns, any adjectives to actually put into those sentences, then we can't actually say much. Uh, so, you know, vocabulary really is central to communication. It's central, isn't it, to any uh, language. So it's obvious, vocabulary is important. Uh, so the next question is, how do we go about teaching it and learning it? And I've got six basic thoughts uh, that I'm going to share with you. Um, there will be a little bit of theory, but there will also be uh, some activities that you can take away and use immediately with your students, okay? Uh, now, my six thoughts about vocabulary teaching and learning, here is the first one, okay? Now, you may have heard before of this differentiation between active vocabulary for active use or vocabulary for passive use. Um, what does this really mean? Um, it's an important question. For example, um, imagine we've got our reading text from Gateway. This is from Gateway B1 about translating Harry Potter. Um, if you look uh, at the bottom, you'll see that um, there are, uh, there is a vocabulary exercise here, yeah? And this vocabulary exercise, which is typical in the reading exercises, uh, is to help the students to understand the text. But it's vocabulary that, that the students will not necessarily need to remember. Um, maybe they will remember it, which is great. But if they don't, it's not so important because we're teaching the words really just to help them to do the reading exercise. So this is what we would call teaching for passive use, okay? Um, a good example, I think, is songs, isn't it? This is a, a famous um, Katy Perry song, Firework. Um, and uh, this song, when you do songs in class, there are words here that maybe you want to teach, okay? Uh, maybe you do want to teach firework, you want to teach hurricane, you want to teach rainbow, okay? But if you look, for example, a little bit later, we've got the word uh, ignite, okay? Now, this is a word that maybe the students need to understand to do the song, to understand the song. They want to know what it means, but you don't necessarily want the students to remember the word afterwards. So this is what we would mean then by teaching vocabulary for passive use. They just need the words to be able to remember for uh, doing the song, doing the listening, doing the reading, but they don't necessarily need to remember the words after. 
Now, on the other hand, if you're using a uh, gateway, you'll know that the first page in each unit is, in fact, uh, the vocabulary teaching page. And here, the important thing is that you do want the students to remember the words and you want the students to use the words, okay? So all of those, all of those words there, which are in the boxes, you want the students to be able to actively use, not just recognize, okay? So we've got passive use, which is just uh, understanding the words, but not being able to use them. And then we've got active use, which is actually being able to use the words in conversation and in speech. And if you uh, do use Gateway, you'll know that, for example, the final activity is nearly always a speaking activity. And the idea there is the students are really uh, playing with those words, they're using them in conversation, maybe using them in speech. Okay, now, um, if they need to use the words in writing, well, obviously, they need to know the spelling, okay? Uh, whereas with passive use, they don't need to remember the spelling. Um, what I've got here are just a couple of activities which are good for practicing spelling. Um, and they're a great way of starting off a class. You could do um, a warmer doing either of three, these three activities. Spelling forwards, spelling backwards, or spelling in the air. First one, I'm going to use um, Gateway B1+. Plus. And um, you all, you can see the chat box here because that's where I want you to write something. I'm going to spell a word. Uh, as soon as you think you know what the word is, can you write it in the chat box? Okay, everybody understand. I spell the word and I want you to write it in the box. Okay, are we ready? Here we go. Number one, A, T, H, L, E, T, I, C, S. What is the word? Do you want me to spell it again? Yes, Somebody's, uh, Victoria's got it right straight away. Good, excellent, okay. Um, next word, okay, next word. Um, B, O, X, I, N, G. What's the word? Okay, what I want you to do now, let's see if you can do this faster. So I want you to guess the word. I'm gonna start spelling it. And I want you to, if you, you might not be 100% sure, but if you think you know the word, I want you to spell it as soon as you think you know the word. Okay, let's try one more. Uh, S-N-O-W, B, any guesses? O, A, not quite. <laughs> B O A R D I N G. Anna's almost got it. Anna's got the first part of the word. Because it's actually, they're all sports, okay? So the word is? Exactly, snowboarding. Brilliant. Um, right, now, to do this activity, of course, it's interesting that the students, the same as you now, you actually have to concentrate quite hard to make sure that you uh, listen and you've got to keep the letters in your head. So it's a very good activity just for getting the students to concentrate, okay? And of course, like any vocabulary activity, you can really make this into a game, can't you? So that it is a competition. The first person to guess the word correctly maybe gets a point, or the first team who guesses the word can get a point. Now, that's just normal spelling forwards. I'm actually gonna do something which is more difficult. Some people find this very difficult. Some people find it easy. But I'm gonna spell the word backwards, okay? So I'm gonna start with the end of the word. Okay, are you ready? L, L, A, B, T, O, O, F. Have you got it? So we went backwards, I'll start again. Yeah, Natalie has got it. Natalie gets 10 points, okay? Uh, the word was football, okay? Obviously, this is more difficult, yeah, because you've got to hold the letters in your head and also think that you're going backwards. Uh, let's try one more example, okay? Uh, S, as soon as you think you know the word, I will need to write it, okay? S, I, N, N, E, and there's one more letter, 
the last letter. Yes, you got it, without giving the last letter. The last letter was T. Um, so again, this is quite good fun in CAS because it is more difficult. Um, and we're really getting to know the word well. So I would begin by spelling forwards, spelling backwards. We're practicing the alphabet, which don't you find it's amazing sometimes that even high-level students forget uh, the letters of the alphabet. Uh, so good practice for that. Um, another fun activity that we can do with spelling is spelling in the air, okay? So what I want you to do is to watch my finger and I'm gonna spell a word, okay? And I want you to tell me what is my word. Okay, so this is the first letter. Okay, first letter. Second letter. Third letter. Okay, and the fourth letter. Any idea? Uh, nearly. The last letter was wrong. I'm going to show you the last letter again, okay? The last letter was... Natalie's got it right, Elena's got it right, it was golf, okay, golf. Should we do one more? One more example, okay? So watch my finger, um, right, this one, okay? I'll, I'll give you a clue, okay? It's another, uh, it's another sport, okay? You ready? And the last letter. Anybody got it? It's a little bit difficult maybe with the camera image. I'll do it again, okay? First letter. Got it? Does anybody, at least what's the first, what is the first letter? Maybe that's the difficult one, is it? The first letter is watch this. So we've got the top here. <laughs> J, okay, the first letter is J. Second letter? That should be easy, yeah? Yeah, third letter? Anybody? D, okay, and so the last letter, Elena's got it, okay, Elena and Anne have got it. Um, you're using your finger, it's quite good fun in class. Try this uh, tomorrow in your classes. Um, it's a good idea to tell them, obviously, the group of words, so tell them that they're, they're sports or tell them that they're jobs or whatever. Um, and of course, in class, uh, we've got the problem here of the image, maybe the image makes it a little bit more difficult to see. But of course, try it with your class. Of course, if they don't get it the first time, it doesn't matter, just keep on, as we did here, just keep on trying. Um, and it's a nice way of practicing the spelling. So as I said, if we want our students to be able to write our target vocabulary, then we need to make sure that they can spell it. Uh, now, let's think also about pronunciation, because if we want our students to use the words in speech, then they also need to know, obviously, the pronunciation. And I would say that one of the most useful ways, the useful things to, um, to help our students with pronunciation is word stress, okay? Now, this is a simple activity which occasionally comes in Gateway, but you can do it with any group of vocabulary, even when it doesn't come on the page. This is a simple activity that we can do to make sure our students get the uh, pronunciation of our new vocabulary right. We've got three columns, you can see. We put these on the blackboard. The first column means that they are words with two syllables, and the stress is on the first syllable. The second column is words with two syllables, but the stress is on the second uh, syllable. And the third column would be words with three syllables, and the stress is in the middle. And what you do is you ask students in pairs to take the vocabulary from the vocabulary page and simply put it into the correct column. So, for example, if we take the first word there, which column would you put that word in? In the first, the second, or the third? So, number one, two, or three, arrivals. Where would we put it? We've got a difference of opinion, okay? Is it two or three? How many syllables has it got, arrivals? It would be column three, yeah, because we've got three syllables. Arrivals, yeah? So, three syllables, arrivals. Now, the best way to do this, by the way, for you and for your students, is of course to actually not just read the word, but to say the word aloud. And um, that's why I get them to do this in pairs, because it's much easier when they start to say the word. Uh, for example, the second word, if you just say it to yourself, 
Which column would it go in? The first, second, or third? Yeah, we've all got it right. Yeah, so it's the first column, two syllables, and the stress is on the first syllable. So it's cancel. Um, but the students, if they're not sure, they can play with the word. So they can say cancel, cancel, which, which sounds better. Um, what about the next word, the third word? Which column does that go in? We all agree? Column two. OK, great. Very simple, very easy to do, but a very good activity to get the students to play with the pronunciation, to check that they get it right. So they put the words in the correct column. I'll show you the complete columns here. Yeah. Um, and the students play with the words, they practice the pronunciation, you check uh, with the whole class, they can listen to you, for example, saying the words with the correct stress to check that they have it right, and then they can practice saying the words again. The point is that if we teach these words, all of these words from Gateway B1+, Plus connected with travel, if we teach them and we want the students to be able to use the words, so if they can use the words in the conversation, we need to check that they can actually say the words correctly. Um, again, uh, to go back to my idea of passive vocabulary, if it's the word ignite in a song that they just need to understand, then you don't need to check that they can pronounce the words correctly. But if we want the students to use the words, we do need to practice that. OK, is everybody happy? Am I speaking too quickly, too slowly? Is everybody, is everybody still with me? We're good? OK, perfect, great, fine. Excellent. Right, now, um, that was uh, my first thought about vocabulary teaching. My second thought is, and this is really central to the way that I teach vocabulary, and it's also central to uh, a book like Gateway. If you want students to remember vocabulary, you have to recycle again and again and again. Um, I think that teaching vocabulary is easy. I could go into my class now and teach 20 words. I can teach 20 words, but the students will not remember 20 words. It's impossible unless you do recycle again and again and again. Um, that obviously explains why in Gateway, at the end of each unit, we have our vocabulary revision. So we've taught the vocabulary through the unit, but if we really want the students to remember those words, we have to recycle them, okay? We have to check that they do, in fact, remember the words. So we can use this recycling page. We can obviously use our workbook. Um, one thing, if you're using the Gateway workbook, do remember that the um, progress test pages, which are towards the back of the book, I think they're particularly useful because what we do on those pages is we recycle not just the unit, not just the last two units, but we recycle the whole of the book so far. And the thing with vocabulary teaching is that if you are going to teach uh, vocabulary in this unit, you want them to remember it, but you also want your students to remember everything they did. In April, you want them to remember what they did in April, but also what they did in March, February, January, up to September. So that recycling is uh, very, very important. Constant recycling, and whether it's doing things like uh, online, this is from Gateway Online, practicing with Gateway Online, just again, practicing vocabulary. Basically, anything that you can do to get the students to recycle all of the words that you've taught. Because if you don't recycle, you're teaching vocabulary, but the students are not learning, and there's not much point in teaching if there is no learning happening. Now, here are two other activities which um, are very nice ways of recycling vocabulary. Um, word searches, okay? I'm sure you all use word searches in class from time to time. How about getting the students themselves to prepare the word search? So you imagine that we've just finished maybe Unit 5 of Gateway, then simply ask them to fill in a word search like this with, for example, 10 words from the units that they think are important, okay? Uh, by the way, this is very, very easy to find on the internet. If you simply search, for example, uh, for word search, um, you'll find lots of free uh, activities like this that you can simply print out and use with your students. Imagine then, unit five, I tell them to think of 10 words that they want to practice. They write the words uh, wherever they want here, yeah? And they also, of course, 
write definitions of the words. And this is useful practice, okay? So they write definitions, um, and that way they are thinking about the words themselves. They're checking that they remember the words. Um, actually, instead of definitions, you could do uh, maybe even translation if you preferred at lower levels. Or maybe also at low levels and low ages, you could even draw pictures. Okay, so if you were doing sports, maybe you could draw pictures of the sports instead of writing. But obviously, at a higher level, then get the students to write definitions. When they've finished preparing their own word search, then of course what they can do is give their word search to other students in the class. So they're getting twice the amount of practice. Okay, so very simple activity, very simple to prepare. In fact, the really good thing about this activity is that the students are doing all of the work, not you, which is maybe how it should be in English class here, yeah? that the students are doing the work, you're helping them to do the work, but they're doing all of the hard work themselves. We've got that word search. We could do the same with a crossword, couldn't we? So I've simply drawn a quick grid here, and then you get the students to write the words in the spaces wherever they like. And here, of course, then they write their definitions. Um, really, again, the same principle, the same idea. It's a nice way of finishing a unit, okay, just to be recycling what they've done in the unit and just checking that they do remember exactly what the words mean. The great thing is, is again, we could do this with translation, with definitions, with examples, and we could even do it with uh, pictures, again, if we wanted to. So, very simple, very basic, but actually you get lots and lots of practice. And in fact, you probably would almost get a whole class uh, of practice by doing something like this, okay? Because obviously it takes the students a while to look up the words, to write them in, to write the definitions and then they transfer to another student. Uh, so they're preparing the crossword for their colleagues. Okay, so recycling, basic uh, idea, but very important to recycle as much as we can. Now, my third thought about vocabulary, which uh, was also important when I was uh, writing Gateway, is word formation, okay, and systems of vocabulary. Now, um, what I mean here, if you use Gateway, you'll know in developing vocabulary, we can teach groups of words like sports or like jobs or like transport, but we can also uh, teach things like word, word formation, prefixes and suffixes. Why? Um, why is it useful for students to know about prefixes and suffixes? Well, I would say it's useful because it aids comprehension. So when a student sees a new word that they, they don't really know, uh, but if they know that, for example, the prefix re means again, then it's giving them a clue about the meaning, especially in the context. If they finish the word with ly, then they might not know the word, but they probably know that it's an adverb, and that might help them to work out what it means in context. So word formation is useful for aiding comprehension and reading in particular, but it also expands students' vocabulary very, very quickly. Um, I was doing this recently with my own students, uh, with uh, actually Gateway B2+. Plus. And I'm going to give you the word cook in the chat box. Can you write any words that you can make by adding either a prefix or a suffix? Okay, so what could we add to cook to make a new word in English? Can anybody write down any words that you can think of? Cooker, yes, exactly. Cookery, perfect. Pre-cook, brilliant, yeah, so you can have pre-cooked food, you can pre-cook something. Um, what about if you're not a good overcook? Brilliant, yes, exactly. And the opposite? Opposite of overcook? Undercook, okay, yeah, undercook. Right, now, what we're doing is straight away with one simple word like cook, we can already immediately think of six, seven, eight words that we can make with uh, that basic word and by adding prefixes and suffixes. So when you think of our students, by just teaching prefixes and uh, suffixes, we're really suddenly expanding their vocabulary very, very quickly. So it's very, very powerful. Uh, another reason why word formation is useful is, of course, it helps students to do exam tasks. The typical task where you have a text, a space, uh, and then you give them the word cook, for example, and from the context, they have to work out what word uh, they need. 
So um, it's very useful. That's why in Gateway then systematically we teach prefixes, we teach uh, prefixes, then we teach suffixes, uh, negative suffixes, for example, which is complicated when you use un, when you use in. Um, but very much the idea is to help the students to increase their vocabulary very quickly. Here's a little game which is one of my favorites, okay? Imagine that you are uh, teaching, you've got your class, you have uh, two teams, okay? You can adapt this with larger classes to in, uh, involve different uh, smaller groups. Imagine though we have two teams, team A, team B. You simply give them a prefix or a suffix. So in this case, you give the prefix miss. By the way, can you just tell me what does the prefix miss mean? Why do we use the prefix miss? What meaning does it give to a word? Miss. Wrong, that's right. So, <laughs> wrong, that's right. Uh, so if you misunderstand, it's not just that you don't understand, it's that you understand in an incorrect way. You understand wrongly, okay? So um, you imagine two teams, you say, uh, you make sure that you get a captain in each team who's the spokesperson, and then you simply say, uh, give me a word with that prefix. So team A says misunderstand, team B says mishear, team A says misconception, team B says mispronounce. Then team A says Miss America, which sometimes your students will, and as, as we all know, Miss America is totally incorrect. So in that case, you would lose the point, okay? That team loses the point. So you lose the point if you say an incorrect word or if you repeat a word, okay? So you imagine that team A says misunderstand and later team B says misunderstand, then in that case, they lose the point because there's been repetition. And thirdly, um, you lose the point if you can't think of a word. Okay, so very simple way of getting the students to practice uh, prefixes and suffixes um, and a great way of uh, making it fun, making it enjoyable, which we will come back to at the end. Um, let's just uh, have a quick look. Uh, it does say to continue the game, then I would continue with the suffix ship. And remember, it is a suffix, okay, not the word ship, but the suffix ship. Can you just write in the, the chat box any words that you know in English which finish with the suffix ship? Friendship, great. Any others? Membership, brilliant. Relationship, perfect. French partnership, yes. Yeah, great words. Friendship, spelling gone wrong there. <laughs> Scholarship, yes. But what about the Lord of the Rings? A lot of people know a word because of Lord of the Rings. Does anybody know a word connected with Lord of the Rings which has ship at the end? No, you don't like Lord of the Rings. Begins with F. Okay, fellowship, okay, fellowship. You know the fellowship where they group together, okay, so we can talk about fellowship. Great, so vocabulary tennis, simply a way of practicing word formation. Now, um, exactly, yes, fellowship. Uh, now, uh, the other thing that we talked about, we talked about systems of vocabulary. Um, also, another activity to practice that, to practice um, prefixes, this is noughts and crosses, okay? Simply uh, put this on the blackboard, so you've got nine squares, you've got two teams, uh, one team chooses a box, for example, they choose, again, the, the prefix miss. If they can give you three words that begin with that prefix, then the square is theirs, and they can either put a, a cross or a naught, okay? Then it's team B's turn, they choose a square, if they can give you three words that begin, for example, with the prefix over, then they also get the square. Uh, if they get it wrong, then they don't get the square, and it's the other team's turn, and they could try to win the square. And the idea, obviously, is to get three in a line, so you're getting a typical noughts and crosses, tic-tac-toe game. Again, very simple, but you can generate lots of words and you can do it by using a game which uh, the students will enjoy making it into a competition. So if the students can give you uh, three words beginning with that prefix, the square is for them. We could do the same thing, of course, with suffixes. Okay, so simple idea. Now, um, we talked about word formation. Another system of vocabulary, if you like, is phrasal verbs, okay? And again, if you're using uh, Gateway, you'll know that the way that we usually teach phrasal verbs is 
um, connecting them by the topic. So here we do have vocabulary, phrasal verbs connected with sport. Okay. Um, if you connect the phrasal verbs to a topic, it means that it should be easier for the students to remember them because the topic will help them to remember the different words that you've chosen. Another important thing about teaching uh, phrasal verbs, I think, is limiting the number. So usually in Gateway, you'll get, for example, seven, eight phrasal verbs. You won't get 20 phrasal verbs all put together. And that actually does bring me on to my next point of vocabulary. Um, and this is a, a, a point that, for me, is quite important, is that giving a list of vocabulary is not the same as teaching vocabulary. Now, I say this because I always seem to have colleagues, and I've always seen um, teachers uh, giving these lists of words. For example, the typical list of phrasal verbs. Have you ever seen this type of list? Uh, I want to make it clear that I think giving a list of vocabulary is very useful if it's reference. Uh, for example, even in, obviously in Gateway and in all textbooks, you're going to have uh, word lists at the end of the unit. I think that's useful because it is useful reference. I think it's also useful if the students themselves write their vocabulary lists. But for example, if you ever find yourself giving a list of phrasal verbs and saying, OK, um, these words are new for you. I want you to remember them, and we're going to have a test on Friday. Then I think that that is not really teaching, and it's quite unfair to the students. There's no context. There's no easy way for them to remember. And so what's happening is I think you're simply confusing uh, your students if you give this list without a context. To teach phrasal verbs, they need to be in small groups. They need to be um, connected, if possible, via the topic. And you need to put them in context and recycle and revise them in context. And as soon as you find yourself simply giving out that list, it's possible that you're just going to confuse your students. So I would say that don't confuse um, lists with teaching. And that actually also does bring me on to my fifth thought about teaching vocabulary, which is that you don't learn vocabulary by magic. And I think that that sounds obvious. But what I mean is uh, that, you know, as I said before with recycling, if you present 10 words to your students tomorrow in, in your class, that might be quite easy. But you can't expect the students to actually remember those words or to be able to use the words if they don't, for example, write the words down. OK, and this is just something which is basic, but sometimes uh, students don't do it. Writing down new vocabulary. And I have a little system that I use in my class, which are these things, OK? I don't know if you can see them. They're vocabulary cards, OK? This is just an idea that uh, you might find useful for your lessons. What are these vocabulary cards? Well, you can see that they're sheets of paper that I've cut into eight. So it's just this size. Yeah. And what I do is I write down all of the new words that I teach in class. Okay, So as soon as I teach a word, we've just seen, for example, sports. We had uh, athletics, golf. When you teach those new words, then you write each word down on a different card. Okay, Remember, this is words that you want the students to remember. Okay. And then what I do is I keep these words together. And every, every time I go into class, I always write down and I take these words into class. One thing, even if you're teaching two or three classes of the same level, even if they're using the same uh, course book, I still have a separate set. Why? Because I've discovered over the years that, in fact, what you teach one group is always very difficult, uh, sorry, is very different from what you teach another group. Many words will be the same, but many words will be different because the students are different. Maybe a student, uh, you're looking at jobs, and the student wants to know how you say technician because their father is a computer technician. That happens in one class, but it might not happen in the other class. OK? Hi, Natalia. <laughs> um, so that way, you remember exactly what you've taught. And the great thing is that, for example, in March, you remember exactly what you taught, even the words that you taught in September, because you've written them down here. Okay, Very important then. Write them down, 
Why are they useful? Because you remember what words you taught. Also, they encourage students to keep their own record of new vocabulary. Now, I've put encourage in inverted commas. What I mean is when I write down a word, all of my students say, what are you writing down? And they start writing it in their vocabulary list. Why? Because they know that at some moment, I will probably give them a vocabulary test based on the vocabulary here. So they realize that it's important because they will need to remember the word. Uh, vocabulary tests, not very fashionable maybe, um, but actually, you know, as we said, you don't learn vocabulary by magic. When students study biology or physics, there are certain things they have to remember and they have to study. So I don't think there's a particular problem if we ask our students to study vocabulary lists, word lists, so that they can actually remember more. Another reason for using these vocabulary cards is you probably feel when you teach grammar that they've seen the present perfect once, twice, three times, uh, and they don't feel as if they're learning it because they think they've done it before. When you write down new vocabulary, it's very visible, it's very tangible how much vocabulary they've learned. So at the end of the year, they can say that this is what they have learned. So it's great. It's actually very physical. So it makes them feel that they are really learning something in their class. And the other great thing about vocabulary cards is that they give you... Uh, they help you to do a game. Imagine that you want to play hangman or pictionary in your class tomorrow, then you know immediately which words you've taught and which words you want to recycle. Okay, so an idea there uh, is using class vocabulary cards. It helps you and it helps the students to remember and to write down exactly what words you've taught. And the great thing is that you can use them, as I said, for games. And I think my last thought about vocabulary teaching is that actually the good thing about vocabulary teaching is it can be fun. There are lots of games that we can do to help students to remember vocabulary. Um, this uh, activity, uh, I'll show you at the end. There's a slide which shows you the Gateway Facebook page. But recently, we've had a competition on the Gateway Facebook page, which is to share your favorite activity. And this was a great activity from Alina Popov, who I think is from Romania, I think. Um, and she had this idea which reminded me of a game that I used to play. Swat the word. So you give your students uh, two teams. You give them a fly swatter. On the board, you write down, for example, 20 words, 20 of your words from here, 20 words you want to revise. You write them on the board, all over the board, any position. And then what you do is you read out a definition of one of the words, and the team uh, that hits the word with their fly swatter fastest gets the point. It's a lovely activity because there's a bit of physical uh, movement there, which is going to keep them active and uh, stop them getting bored, stop them falling asleep in class. But at the same time, of course, you're doing really useful vocabulary uh, revision. So I'll just explain again. Put, for example, 20 words on the board, two teams. Each team has a fly swatter. Uh, you say the word. Of course, they don't need a fly swatter. They could simply touch the board or they could point to the board. But the first team to touch the word gets a point. Okay, so a nice little game, a nice way to start a class, very active. Another activity which is a favorite of mine is the A to Z of. Okay, so this is simply a way of revising a lexical set in a challenging way. So, for example, the A to Z of sports. Okay, so for example, can you in the chat box, can you write down a word? either a sport or a word connected to sport, which begins with A. A word beginning with A connected with sport. Like to write anything down? Anfield. <laughs> Athletics, brilliant. Yeah, B, what about B? Box, yeah, boxing, basketball, ball, bobsleigh, brilliant, yeah. C, cycling, Right, you get the idea, okay? Obviously, if there is a letter which is difficult, then the students um, leave that letter and they just come back to it later. Or the competition could be how many, uh, how many letters can you uh, use to make different words connected with sports. But it's just a simple way of, of revising any lexical set, okay? So it could be sports, it could be jobs, it could be anything, adjectives of personality, okay? Okay, um, there I started off with athletics, basketball, and cricket. 
Uh, again, we're doing this activity very quickly. In class, you would be spending 10 minutes at least uh, letting the students think they could share their ideas on the blackboard, for example. Okay, So the A to Z of, which actually is used uh, occasionally in uh, the units in Gateway, but you can use it for any vocabulary set that you're teaching at any moment. Okay, um, I'm actually going to jump the last activities because I don't think I'm going to have time. Because um, I just wanted to recycle the six main ideas that I was talking about. Uh, I said that recycling is important, and this is a nice way of ending your classes, by the way, is at the end of any class, just ask the students, okay, what did we do today? So, you know, what did we study today? What did we practice today? Why did we practice it? Um, so I'm going to be the teacher here as well and ask you, can you remember, what was my, I showed you six thought bubbles, what was the first one I showed you? Does anybody remember? What was my first point about vocabulary teaching? What did I say? Does anybody remember? Anybody who was here from the start? Yeah, before spelling I talked about the idea of two different types of vocabulary use. Does anybody remember, remember what they were? Exactly, passive and active, that's right. So the first thing I mentioned was I think it's important to decide between active and passive vocabulary. Um, does anybody remember the second point? It was uh, something about uh, repetition. What did I say about vocabulary that is central to vocabulary teaching? I talked about spelling and I talked about the fact that it's important to recycle, yeah? And I said that you have to recycle again and again and again, exactly, yeah. That was my next point. The next point was um, connected with phrasal verbs and word formation. I said that basically word formation and systems of vocabulary are useful because they expand uh, a, ver uh, a student's vocabulary very quickly. The fourth point I made was that giving lists is not the same as teaching. Lists are useful for revising or for recycling as we're doing here, but a, uh, a list of vocabulary is not an excuse for saying that you're teaching vocabulary. The fifth point I made was about learning vocabulary by magic, that you actually have to write down the words, you have to study the words. Um, and what was my last point with my fly swatting and my A to Z? Exactly, the last point I made was teaching vocabulary can be fun. Great, okay, those are my main points. Um, of course, the thing with vocabulary is sometimes it goes wrong and it can be fun when vocabulary goes wrong. Um, you always see funny menus, don't you? When I travel, I see lots of funny menus in English where the translation is terrible. This is funny, isn't it? So we've got milk coffee, we've got strong coffee, and in the middle we've got this, which I don't think I want to try. We've got tasteless coffee, okay? Maybe not a good idea to have tasteless coffee. Uh, Wikipedia, I mean, Wikipedia is very useful, but I'm not sure if I want to eat stir-fried Wikipedia. I'm not sure if I want to eat steam eggs with Wikipedia. So I don't know what's happened with the translation there, but something has definitely gone wrong. Uh, and this, I've got no idea what this uh, is meant to be in the original version. The car hit cheese bacon mushroom face. I have no idea. Actually, the picture looks quite good, but I have no idea what's happened with the translation. Okay. So anyway, uh, it's useful to teach vocabulary so that students don't make mistakes like some of those mistakes there. Um, just to finish, I want to um, remind you um, about the Gateway Facebook page. Um, I know that we have um, a lot of teachers from Ukraine on this uh, Facebook page, but if you're not already following, you might like to follow. On this uh, Gateway Facebook page, we have um, tips every, uh, nearly every week, usually every week, we have a tip, uh, which is uh, a useful thing that you can do in your class. We also um, have competitions. Uh, we just finished one competition, which uh, was very successful. Uh, we had lots of great entries sharing classroom activities. And so it's a great way, even if you don't want to join the competition, you'll see if you look at the Facebook page, here's the address again, you'll see that there are lots of people who've shared really nice activities that you can then go and take away in your class. Um, and we also sometimes have, a, have our funny signs, uh, the same as uh, the signs that we've just seen now. Um, that's it from me. Um, of course, at the moment, it's a little bit tricky to uh, maybe come to Ukraine, but uh, I hope that I'll be back as soon as I possibly can. 
Uh, this was from the last trip that I made, I think, to Ukraine, which was in Odessa, with some lovely people that I met there in Odessa. Uh, this, I believe, do you know how, where this is? Does anybody know? Uh, this is in Kiev, yeah. Uh, this was uh, Vika, who we, uh, she took me around and uh, showed me lots of different places in Kiev. Look, here I am as well in Kiev. Uh, this was uh, giving talks in, in, in uh, I'm not sure if it was the university maybe. I know that this is Mr. Shevchenko, right? Mr. Shevchenko was watching. Um, thanks to everybody, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy the next talks with Rebecca now, and then uh, the third talk, which I think is Amanda maybe, with the last one. Thank you very much. Um, I believe that you say Doskoroi, is that correct? Doskoroi. Thanks very much. Um, if anybody does have questions, then the best thing to do, I think, would be to get in touch via the Facebook page, because I always answer personally if anybody does have any questions, or if anybody has any comments or wants to share any vocabulary activities there. I think I've finished just on time. Thank you very, very much for uh, attending, and as I say, I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar sessions for Ukraine. Okay? Thanks very much. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Dave. Great job. And um, yes, you're spot on with the time. I'm sorry, I forgot to set the timer up for you. So you did a really good job there um, managing that. OK, everyone. Uh, so that's the first talk. But we've got um, a couple more still to come. The next presenter is going to be uh, Rebecca, who will start at half past. So we now have a, a short break for you. Uh, so go and grab a drink if you like to. I'm just going to have to uh, load up Rebecca's slides in the meantime. Uh, so just stay where you are, stay logged in, um, you're in the right room. Um, the next talk will happen here. Uh, Rebecca is logged in, I can see. So Rebecca, um, if you'd like to just do the audio setup, then we'll do a little uh, sound check in about five minutes when I've got your slides ready. Okay, I'll just turn off my video quickly now. Hope you're all doing well um, and that you enjoyed David Spencer's webinar if you just took part in that one. My name's uh, Rebecca Rob Benner and I'm talking to you from Denmark today. Uh, I'm really glad to have the chance to do this uh, webinar for you in the Ukraine. I'm afraid I haven't visited the Ukraine, but um, I do hope to do so in the future. So, um, first perhaps a little bit of background on me. Um, I trained as a secondary teacher of French and German and English as a foreign language, and I've taught both teenagers and adults in the UK, Germany, and Denmark. Um, for the last 15 years, I've also been writing materials for teenagers and adults, and I'm one of the co-authors of Matt Mullen's new teenage course, Beyond, along with Robert Campbell and Rob um, Beyond is a six level course, it goes from A1 plus to B2 level, and I'll be taking examples from Beyond in this webinar, um, mainly from the A2 plus and B1 levels. Um, but essentially we'll be looking at practical tips and ideas which you can use in your classroom, whatever course book you use. As Henry said, there's a handout with the links and references from the talk, which he will share at the end. So you don't need to write anything down as you're listening. I can see somebody saying I need more light on my face. Let me put turn on my light here, just a moment. OK, is that better? OK, let me, there we go. OK, good. Right, I'd like to start then um, by looking briefly at the importance and complexity of uh, vocabulary. Uh, I'm going to do this by sharing two quotes with you. This is the first one um, by a, a linguist called David Wilkins. And I think you'll agree that um, vocabulary is often given less priority than grammar in language teaching. But it's probably the most important. If, if you went into a shop, for example, and said, excuse me, do you have any 
but couldn't complete your sentence because you didn't know the word of the thing that you wanted, you, you obviously wouldn't get very far. But if you just said apples um, or whatever it was that you needed, you would get a result. People might think you're slightly rude, but you would certainly get a result. Okay, the second quote that I'd like to share with you is from a book called The Vocabulary Matrix, which is a methodology book about understanding and teaching vocabulary. Some of you might know it. Um, 